Good afternoon and uh, welcome to another in our series of Estelle Shohet Bretman Memorial Lectures made possible by the International Catacomb Society in honor of Estelle Bretman, their founder and a longtime gallery instructor here at the Museum of Fine Arts. I'm John Herman, the John F. Cogan Jr. and Mary L. Corneal, Curator of Classical Art. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you Donald Kyle, Professor of History at the University of Texas at Arlington. Professor Kyle is a very distinguished expert on athletics in Greek and Roman antiquity. And the subject of his studies is of direct relevance for the exhibition that the museum will be presenting four months from now on Greek athletics. I'd like to say that it's a great honor to present a Bretman Memorial Lecture as sponsored by the International Catacomb Society. And I'd like to thank Laura Gadbury, Christine Condolion, Alice Perry, Lois Solomon, and of course, John Herman. <laughs> but the real stars here are the artifacts relating to the ancient, ancient uh, Olympics and other games, many of them in the Museum of Fine Arts exhibitions. And the new exhibition that's coming this summer, please show up for this because it's going to be spectacular with images like this, this wonderful discus throw in the tond on a tondo of a, a kylix. Uh, it's going to be something that will attract international attention. So why am I here? Not because I'm a Greek. I'm not an athlete, in fact, and I'm not a great scholar. In truth, I'm here more because of timing than talent, because the Olympics are returning to the land of their birth in 2004, finally. Athens 2004 will raise questions about the revival, authenticity, the Greekness of these games. So today, let's revisit the ancient Olympics and let's note historical aspects, both relevant and irrelevant for the modern games. Getting at the relevance and the reality of the ancient games, however, is a challenge. We need to be conscious of the limitations of the ancient evidence, and we need to be conscious of ourselves. Relevance is relative. It's what we make of it. And it changes with our time and our experience. In bringing our present mind to the evidence of the past, we inevitably alter it. By innocent nostalgia or devious designs, we bend antiquity to our values and our needs. History is written by the victors, and the present tends to win out over the past. So let's be wary of anachronistic ideological agendas, of unconsciously imposing modern concerns, issues, and biases on the distant and defenseless past. First, we should not look at the ancient Olympics backwards with hindsight through the prism of the modern Olympics. There would be no modern Olympics if there had not been ancient Olympics. But that doesn't mean that the modern games are, should be, or could be an exact replication of the ancient games. Here's decathlete Dan O'Brien with his discus, <coughs> looking very non-ancient, from the 1996 Centennial Games at Atlanta, games which should have been held in Athens if the modern games truly are revived Greek games. Yes, all intense sport shares effort and excitement, but the cynics can point out that the ancient and modern Olympics have little in common. They share the name, a few events, the four-year cycle, and the idea of an oath and peaceful competition. Not much else. The ancient games were always at Olympia. They had no women's events, no winter Olympics were held. There were no water sports, no ball sports, no team sports, no medals, no decathlon. The Olympics that were returned to Greece in 2004 certainly have changed from 1896, the simpler time of this marvelous discus thrower with the great shirt and what passed for track shoes at that time, apparently. <laughs> Many think that recent games of the Olympics with professionalism and commercialism have strayed from their authentic origins. But were they authentic, true to ancient times, even in 1896, when revived by this man, Pierre Baron de Coubertin? In the 1890s, our knowledge of ancient Olympia was limited, and it was obscured by modern ideologies, amateurism, the conviction of the corruptive influence of money in sport, Hellenism, cultural reverence for ancient Greece, and elitist athleticism, the belief that sport in schools, happens in my classes, 
the belief that sport in schools helped turn boys into good men. That is, provided that they were sons of good gentlemen in the first place. In the 1890s, systematic German excavations at Olympia, which began in 1875, were creating excitement about Olympia. But Coubertin's perceptions were at best loosely based on literary sources, some of them like Pausanias, looking back from Roman times through an idealistic haze. The games of 1896, with swimming, cycling, fencing, shooting, and so forth, had to be a modern adaptation, a reinvention of an ancient institution. The obvious theme of this 1896 program cover is revival. What it glosses is the aspect of transfer. As well as the Greek and French words here, note the Heracles myth, wrestling with the snake, the relief of athletes, and note the 776-1896 dates here. All of this to connect ancient Olympia with 1896. But also notice the girl here, representing Athena with the owl over her head, and the Acropolis of Athens in the background, the Temple of Olympian Zeus, and the stadium, the Panathenaic Stadium of Athens. All of these to connect the ancient Olympics to ancient Athens, where they were never held. The same thing happened on the 1896 uh, medal for the games. On the one side, it has an image of the Zeus from the Temple uh, uh, of Zeus at Olympia, excuse me, you wake now? <laughs> uh, holding a Nike in his hand. And on the flip side, there's uh, the Acropolis of Athens, the two sides of the modern games. Of necessity, the modern games had to return to Athens, not Olympia. But the staging of the 1896 games in Athens, the capital of a newly liberated and united nation state of Greece, has led to much confusion a nationalistic mixing of symbols from the ancient city of Athens with the distant site of Olympia. I've come to know and love this, and I call it the Athene Olympics. Also notice up here things that are absent. We don't find modern symbols of the Olympics like the five rings, because these things were added after 1896 as the modern games evolved. Some modern Olympic features that seem the most historically authentic, like the torch relay, simply are not. Elsewhere in ancient Greece, as here at Athens, torch races transferred sacred fire from one altar to another. But there's no evidence of any torch relay or race at ancient Olympia. In fact, the torch relay began in Berlin at the Nazi Olympics, so-called Nazi Olympics, in 1936, as what scholars now call an invented tradition. Something from the past was borrowed and adapted to enhance the modern games. More metaphor than artifact, the torch relay took root and blossomed symbolically. It surpassed its non-ancient Olympic origins to become an inclusive, popular celebration, a great improvement upon 1896. So let's not indict the modern games for inconsistencies with antiquity or for changing from the games of 1896. Our world needs symbols of peace and brotherhood but we also need an accurate picture of antiquity, one not viewed through the lenses of the modern Olympics, 19th century ideologies, or even ancient Athens. So why has there been so much confusion and misinformation about the reality of ancient, ancient Greek sport? One early obstacle to our understanding was a prejudice among pointy-headed academics. Unlike Homer the Bard, Herodotus the raconteur, or Pindar the poet, the great historian Thucydides was not very interested in sport. He thought that history should be about war and politics, battles and speeches, and he passed that bias onto modern historians. They therefore regarded play as idle diversion, not a worthy subject for serious study. Despite lip service every four years, only recently have, we main have mainstream scholars fully acknowledged the significance of sport as part of the Greek legacy. I'm delighted that the MFA is putting on this wonderful exhibition in the summer, and it will show that the study of Greek sport has fully come of age, but it took decades of study. Influenced by their own experiences, Olympic scholars have changed their minds over the years in what I see as three stages. First, inspired by masterpieces like this, Myron's discus thrower, 
traditional scholars for most of the 20th century presented the ancient Olympics as a tragic hero caught in a decline and fall scenario. After an early golden age of noble amateur sport, the Olympics fell prey to their own success. Specialization, profit, and professionalism crept in the fifth century, and the games declined sadly into something akin to Roman spectator sport. This romantic vision of youthful utopian purity and lost Edenesque innocence was used to provide moral lessons and warnings for the modern games. Then, in the 1970s, revisionists began challenging the traditional picture of decline and fall. Stimulating archaeological work was continuing, and social historians were asking questions about race, class, and gender. And the modern Olympics, with their crises and tragedies, as in Munich in 72, were undermining our idealism. Disillusioned, scholars re-examined the ancient games far more critically. Now in the third phase, historians, the ones who had been demythologizing the ancient games, have calmed down, or we simply got older. Probably, we were influenced by the rejection of Greece's 1996 Olympic bid. All of us who love Greek civilization thought that that was sad. Understandable, perhaps, but sad. Recently, empathy for Greece and the anticipation of 2004, along with the relative successes of, ancient, of recent Olympiads, have inspired a more mature view, what I like to call the new ancient Olympics, more accurate, yes, but balanced and appreciative. So let's use the themes of gods, athletes, and spectators to guide us as we revisit the new ancient Olympics. And because academics tend to wander and come up with silly ideas, let's focus ourselves on some basic questions. Question number one, when? Whence came the ancient games? Early works claimed that the ancient Greeks invented sport, that the less manly Near Eastern peoples were incapable of physical competition. That exclusivism has to go. As this relief of about 2000 BC of two Mesopotamian boxers with bound wrists indicates, sport was around before Greece, at least some of the events and physical performances, long before Greek civilization. Yet the Greeks remained distinctive for their institutionalization of athletics, that is physical contests with prizes and public festivals. Our first account of athletic competition comes from the funeral games of Patroclus in Homer's Iliad, Book 23. Here, the 6th century painter has added grandstands of Crea from 6th century Athens to Homer's uh, Bronze Age chariot scene. Homer's games, as you may know, were dramatic but not flawless. There was foul play in the chariot race, excited crowds broke into arguments, and the games master Achilles had to settle disputes over placements and valuable prizes by awarding extra prizes as if he was judging figure skating in Utah. <laughs> the Canadians won. Without nudity or wreaths, with elite competitors and rich prizes, weapons and war booty, these were funeral games, sport as surrogate combat. Although scholars wish he had, Homer makes no certain reference to the Olympics, even though he was composing around 725, after the Olympics supposedly began in 776. Rather, in Iliad Book 22, he mentions two types of games. Funeral games for nobles with rich prizes and cultic games with symbolic prizes. The cultic games were more modest but open to all because of their ties to worship. The ancient Olympics came from this latter tradition of cultic games, from religion and life, not from war and death. Uncertain themselves about the origins of their Olympics, the Greeks cast the roots of the games, like everything else of importance, back into the mythologized past of before the Trojan War, tying them to stories like the suitor contest of Hippodamia here, won by Pelops driving the chariot. Greeks believed in founders, so their earliest Olympics, which they placed long before 776, must have had early superhuman or heroic founders such as Heracles, Pelops, and others. Thus, thus, the Olympics of 776 were said to be a revival of earlier discontinued games as people, quote unquote, remembered the events of the old days. Even way back then, as in 1896, the revival of old games was preferred to the invention of new games. 
The stories of Bronze Age and Dark Age, that is pre-776 Olympics, were indeed myths, natural and comforting narrative explanations, not history. Archaeology shows that from about the 10th century on, Olympia was the site of a rustic Zeus cult. Zeus cult excuse me. People came to worship and consult the oracle, leaving dedications like this small bronze tripod. But there's no material evidence of major games around 776. The discovery of wells dug near the stadium suggests that major games didn't develop until around 700 or a bit later. It now seems likely, then, that modest, that is, limited and local games, arose slowly at Olympia as a supplement to the early religious festival, like foot races at a church picnic. Now, funeral games with valuable prizes still continued in Greece, and this discus from our collection here uh, with an inscription, Ecton Heron, Heron, excuse me, maybe from such games around about 500. But the Olympics, which emerged as cultic games from another stream, not funeral games, the Olympics were so successful that they became the model for other crown or pan-Hellenic festivals. That they started slowly and humbly, like many of us, is not demeaning. It just makes the journey that more impressive. The history of the new ancient Olympics is one of growth and success, not one of carefree youth falling into corruption and decline. Question two, where? The location, the sites and sites of Olympia. When Pindar said there is no more glorious place of festival than Olympia, he knew that Olympia was a rural sanctuary in the city-state of Elis, some 36 miles from the actual town of Elis. We got Olympia down here and Elis up here. Important point, ancient Olympia was a cult center, not a city. Its crucial combination of festival and games was brilliant. Religion hallowed and regularized the games, but the games never overtook or secularized the festival. The ancient Greeks didn't believe in the separation of church and stadium. Models of Olympia like this one are stunning, but again, we must avoid doing history backwards. Showing the site at its height, these models are based on the writings of Pausanias, who visited Olympia around 170 AD, but they should not mislead us into inflated notions about Olympia's origins or emergence. Note that we're focusing here on the Altice, the sacred center, and major temples like Zeus and Hera and treasuries and such. As the site plan here shows, the grandest, earliest constructions, such as the Temple of Hera and the Ash Altar of Zeus, are within this sacred sanctuary, within the Altice proper. Religion was the center and athletic facilities slowly arose around the periphery. With the great sacrifice to Zeus as its central act, the Olympic program itself also shows that athletics were a supplemental development. Ancient Olympia's priorities were clear. Gods first, athletes second, spectators third and last. The ruins of the great temple of Zeus here. The worship of Zeus at this fine temple was central and constant at Olympia. It promoted, but it could not guarantee peace and unity. Greeks gathered to share their common culture and love of sport, but the fiercely independent Greek city-states fought and challenged each other, even at Olympia. The famous sacred truce was not a general peace, but rather a hands-off, a safe passage for people traveling to the games. The games did not stop wars among the Greeks widely, but neither did the wars stop the games. War trophies and spoils were put on display at Olympia, as elsewhere, and this beautifully restored Nike of Paionios celebrated a victory by Greeks over other Greeks. Yes, states, including Elis, sometimes politically exploited the games, but exploitation of the Olympics has happened more often today. As I said, to find the athletic facilities, we have to leave the sanctuary proper. Here's the crypte, the entrance tunnel, which we now date uh, later to the latter fourth century. It provided a dramatic entrance to the stadium for athletes and judges. Other people had to enter otherwise. According to Stephen Miller, we also have to the right here an area now that is identified as a changing room and a potatarium. The running track for competitions, the simple Olympic stadium of about the fourth century always remained modest. There were starting lines for races, 
at either end in which men raced against men, not against a clock. But note here, what we have are simple embankments, okay, for spectators. No formal seating for spectators. Just an altar of Demeter, I'm going to come back to that later, and an area here for officials and judges. Spectators were on their own. The practice area for athletes was a gymnasium, uh, but it became an architectural facility only in the second century BC. A Hellenistic benefaction, it was meant for show, and it was really not needed, nor was it heavily used. They didn't have to build it to have them come to Olympia. The athletes had been coming and kept coming for centuries. The logistical problems of hosting the modern games suggest a very good question. Where did all the spectators stay? If the stadium held 40,000, the total crowd was possibly twice that or more. The Leonidion, this prominent ruin southwest of the sanctuary, was not built until the fourth century. And what we have here is a Roman reconstruction. It was a guest house or hotel, fair enough, but only for a few, perhaps 50 VIPs or athletes. There was no Olympic village. Gods and athletes came first. Spectators had to take care of themselves. They complained, we know, about the heat, the noise, the crowds, theft, water shortage, poor sanitation, terribly poor sanitation, but they still came. Most people apparently just camped out as best they could nearby. And one imagines a Greek sporting Woodstock in the meadow <laughs> south of the sanctuary. What about the later history of the site? Since Olympia was a hallowed Greek center, early studies were not interested in the decadent Roman history. Ruins and Roman brick were passed over in pursuit of Greek stone. But recently, archaeologists have concentrated on the Roman era with exciting results. What we have here is a clubhouse of the Guild of Victors at Olympia, built in the first century AD with Roman support. We're learning that, in fact, the Romans, the, excuse me, the Olympics did not suffer and decline under the Roman Empire. Rather, the Romans came to accept and patronize Greek sport. Even Nero, naughty Nero, has found redemption as a sincere, respectful admirer of Olympia. Yes, that's a bit of a stretch, but it is true that Rome assisted Olympia's remarkable longevity. We now know names of victors from as late as 385 AD, and the games continued later than we thought into the 5th century or perhaps even the 6th century AD. So the new ancient Olympics perhaps began with later and humbler roots than we'd like, but they endured better and longer than we'd have thought. The beautiful youth has become the dignified old man of the ancient world. Question three, what took place? What contests were held? This is a fairly traditional approach, the history of sports rather than sport history, but I'll note a few things. This basic 200 meter sprint was the first and only event from 776 till 724. Just one short race. Seems odd, perhaps, at least from hindsight, but remember, the sport was added to the sacred festival, not vice versa. For decades, one race was enough. Other races were added in time, the Daoulos, sort of down and back around a post in 724, and in 720, the Dalikos, a longer race of perhaps 20 lengths of the stadium. And there was even a race in armor added in 520. But that's it. There were no more races. This vase from the museum here is a Panathenaic Prize amphora that probably depicts a local variation, not at Olympia, but at Athens, the Hippias race, of about four lengths, maybe 800 meters. Certainly not an ultra-long distance, not a marathon race. I'll say this plainly case Jim McKay's out there. The marathon race was invented in 1896 and has no real basis in ancient sport. Certainly Greeks could run 26 miles and much further, but as messengers, not as competitors. The great victory of the Greek spirit on Lewis in 1896 at the marathon, their miracle off ice, started a modern phenomenon. Like the torch relay, the marathon remains a great symbol of the modern games, but we can't rewrite ancient history to put either one back at Olympia. The ancient pentathlon included five sub-events, the jump, discus, javelin, wrestling, and running. A controversy about scoring the overall contest now is older than the modern Olympics themselves. We love these problems. 
The debate, however, stems from modern concerns about exactitude and consistency, as in modern sport. It's a problem, a puzzle, for us, not for the ancient Greeks. They figured something out, it worked. There were no complaints. When asked about pictures of uh, pentathletes, or the jumper here, uh, I ask students, you know, point out aspects of interest, and they'll tell me, you know, that the jumper here is using halteres, he's using jumping weights, or they'll say that the discus uh, is thrown in a certain way, or that the javelin is thrown with a thong, or whatever. And I'll have to keep pressing them before they cough up the answer I'm looking for. They ain't got no clothes on. Total nudity. All competitors, all competitors in the stadium were nude. No sandals, no uniforms, no place for endorsements. <laughs> Just a thin coat of olive oil, please. The Greeks themselves weren't sure why they bared, themselves, bared more than their souls to the crowd. They just guessed. <laughs> they guessed, as moderns have, that nudity was pragmatic, that it made races faster or safer, like this sheared sheep here. A certain Orsippus supposedly lost his shorts, won a race, and started a trend. Misguided modern experiments, not conducted by me, have been inconclusive. Rather, it seems likely that Olympic nudity originally was cultic. The absence of a costume was itself a costume, one symbolizing a state of ritual purity appropriate to the early sanctuary and festival. Soon athletic uh, nudity became cultural, a way that the Greeks distinguished themselves from non-Greeks. And there's a new idea out there that nudity, in fact, fostered uh, ideas of, of equality and, and democracy, and it had a political overtone. I'm afraid I'm not convinced by that, uh, because even with nudity, there are ways uh, in terms of equipment and slaves and trainers and so forth, ways that you can communicate status. My son's experience in school was that school uniforms did not homogenize students. Nude athletic bodies were things of beauty, and the homecoming of athletic victors attracted both females and males. It cannot be denied that ancient sport had some homoerotic overtones, or more specifically, pederastic overtones relating to relationships between youths and men, as in myths and art. This statuette from Olympia depicts Zeus carrying off the youth Ganymede to be his cupbearer at Olympus. I'm glad to say this piece is now back at the Museum of Olympia safely after recently being on loan to the Michael Jackson Neverland collection. Note the rooster here, okay? This and other animals, hares and, and rabbits and so forth, often turns up as a courtship gift in scenes with athletes, leading one modern scholar to call the gymnasium a pickup place. A new book from Oxford with this cover scene, based on a vase in the uh, Getty, presents nude physical education, gumnike paideia, as an effective form of socialization an erotically charged relationship of mutual respect whereby a mature male set a cultural example for a teenage youth. However, outside Sparta, pederasty as a social fashion is largely associated with the elite and reflected in the pottery and poetry of the elite. Greek peasants, I suspect, were too busy and too tired to chase boys. Yes, nudity and some degree of pederastic interest did exist, but they were not the raison d'etre of the ancient Greek sports. They were byproducts, not irrelevant, but not essential, and not something that the modern Olympics need to cultivate in the name of authenticity. I think we've gone far enough today from sprinters to skaters. There's little left of the imagination. Yes, ancient Olympia knew nudity, eros, and of course, violence in sport. The Olympic combat or heavy events were not for the faint of heart. Boxing had no weight classes, no rounds, and no time limits. The thongs wrapped around the boxer's hands, as you can see here, uh, were meant to protect the knuckles, not to protect people's face. And there's abundant bloodshed here. But, however, the old idea that the later boxing glove, the so-called kystis, was studded with metal and so forth, and that the Romans were screaming, screaming for more and more blood, that's now rejected as a misconception. This event, which uh, I identify as the pancration, some people feel is a wrestling. Greek sport was brutal enough before Rome arrived. This event, the pancration, combined boxing and wrestling. It allowed punching, kicking, choking, finger breaking, and more. 
just no biting or eye gouging. It went on, like boxing, until someone like this raised his finger and gave up, was incapacitated, or died. Athletes had legal immunity for unintentional homicide. And Pausanias tells us of a posthumous victory in this event. Greece was a warrior society, and soldiers had to be tough. But the supposed revival of the Pancration, an ultimate fighting today, big in the South, this is sick. The games may have started as fairly casual events, won by natural ability, but by the 6th century, the athletes were specialized and they were trained by coaches. Athletes learned tactics and discipline, for training was tough, especially in the combat sports. As Epictetus said, if you want to win at Olympia, you'll have to obey instructions, eat according to regulations, exercise on a fixed schedule. You must hand yourself over to your coaches to a doctor. Then in the contest, you must gouge and be gouged, which is precisely what we have here. One athlete has started gouging his opponent, and the other one responds. Both. There will be times when you will sprain a wrist, turn an ankle, swallow mouthfuls of sand, and be flogged, which is exactly what's going on here, punishing for uh, infractions. And after all that, the worst thing, there are times when you lose. No pain, no gain. Even a great boxer could end up like this. Found at Olympia, this bust of a disfigured man with his flat nose and cauliflower ears is probably a portrait of a historical boxer of about 350 BC. There even were satirical epigrams on Olympic boxers claiming that they were so mutilated that their own dogs couldn't recognize them. They couldn't claim their own inheritances because they were unrecognizable to their families. In this, the skill, the time, the cost, the agony of victory as well as of defeat, ancient and modern Olympians can relate to each other. The rigors of training, however, did not apply in equestrian events, at least not to the super-rich owners of the horses and chariots. It was the wealthy owners, not the drivers, who were proclaimed victors if their entries won. Another scholar uh, has suggested there was social tension in the city-states between the, the horsey rich folk and the uh, gymnastic uh, common folk. I think this is stretching it a little bit. Uh, I think if we win in the Olympics, whether it's in a, a, an equestrian event or a simple run, all members of the city-state, all members of, of the country are going to stand up and cheer. Question four. Who were these athletes and who else attended the games? Got a nice Panathenaic amphora here from uh, the Hood Museum at Dartmouth. And in it, as in others, all the athletes were all free Greek males, members of the oily trinity. But criticism of the Olympics as ethnocentric and exclusive is anachronistic. Greek athletes differed not by ethnicity, but by event and age. Lovely Athenian vase of a boy athlete. Some modern Olympic events have weight classes, but the ancient games had age classes, two, boys up to about the age of 18 and adults from 632 on. Why? One scholar suggests that adults were afraid of losing to their juniors. My teenage sons find this credible, but I think it's more likely that the goal was to increase participation and the appeal of the games. Modern scholars, bless them, heatedly debate the social background of Greek athletes. They want to know more than we can know about the social class and the careers of ancient Olympians. Olympians. <coughs> Excuse me. That was nice. Sometimes we get lucky with inscriptions and chance finds like this one. This inscription from Olympia can be combined with other inscriptions and information from elsewhere, and we can piece together the uh, life of this athlete, Callias, son of Didymius, an Olympic Pancration winter, winner. But this is a rare situation. Usually we just know the victor's name and event, and the date and details remain very uncertain. So it's hard to assess the influence of the Olympics on Greek society or social mobility. Who else was at Olympia besides athletes and spectators? Slaves, salesmen, and more. Yes, as in all ancient societies, masters had slaves to assist them at Olympia. In this vase from the museum, uh, note the small figure over here in the left. Probably a slave attendant. Slaves were not allowed to compete for themselves or even to oil up, 
but slaves or hirelings did play key roles in, Olymp excuse me, in equestrian events, as in this famous and striking situation. This is the jockey of Artemisium, of course. Probably a slave jockey, this very young boy rides without a saddle, saddle or without stirrups, but he has spurs on his heels to spur on this horse. Who else? If enough people gather at a sporting event, then or now, other folks will show up to sell them things or perform for them. Ancient Olympia attracted vendors of votives, victuals, and victory odes. Here we have a flute player and a singer displaying their talents. Diogenes the Cynic complained of sophists, poets, magicians, prophets, lawyers, and merchants, all hawking their wares at the games. The commercialization of sport then is not new. Greeks, ancient and modern, have always been good businessmen. Who's still missing? A whole gender. Pausanias, our main source on females at Olympia, tells us that except for the priestess of Demeter Camune, who was able to watch the games from this altar seat here across from the judge's stand, aside from her, all mature women, gunaikes, were prohibited from attending or even approaching the Olympic Games. He even mentions a mother, Calipatera, who snuck into the games, dressed as a man, to watch her son compete. When, she won, or when he won, in her excitement, the mother tripped over a fence and all was revealed. Hmm. So Janet Jackson was not the first woman to expose herself <laughs> at a major sporting event. <laughs> Unfortunately, we all know Janet did, but the story about this ancient woman is probably just that, a story. I don't think it happened. At another point, Pausanias also says that officials, quote, do not prohibit maidens, parthenoi, from watching the games. But he doesn't explain what he means. Recently, scholars have suggested that while their mothers couldn't be there, young girls attended the Olympics with their fathers and became familiar with the world of men in preparation for marriage. I don't buy this modern sounding speculation at all. <laughs> Aside from the total lack of evidence, I don't think that any Greek father would have wanted to or dared to take his virgin daughter into that crowd of thousands of excited males at Olympia. Sometimes we scholars have too much intelligence and not enough sense. Yes, young maidens outfitted like this girl here did run races at the festivals of Hera using the Olympic Stadium but it was at another time and not as part of the Olympic Festival. This statuette of a girl was probably made at Sparta where girls ran similar races, but as a form of initiation, not an Olympic competition. And also note here that this girl is looking backwards and thus maybe dancing rather than running. I apologize for the poor slide, but the inscription itself is poor. Although women weren't allowed at the games, the list of Olympic victors includes names of women, like Kaniska of Sparta. This inscribed base at Olympia celebrates her chariot win in 396. Women couldn't be present, but they could enter chariots and be proclaimed, as she did, victors in absentia. Another book, a new one, also from Oxford, calls Kaniska an ambitious equestrian expert, quote, champing at the bit for an Olympic victory. Someone is seeing what she wants to see, I'm afraid. For the best ancient sources agree that Kaniska's brother, Agesilaus of Sparta, pressured his sister to compete, to embarrass males who were overly proud of their chariot wins. She won, but women were still excluded. No Title IX for ancient Olympia. In terms of gender, then, the ancient games have become less relevant, but the modern games, in adding events for females, they've taken a great step forward. The fifth and best question, why attend or compete as a spectator or as an athlete? Spectators accepted the discomforts at Olympia because they loved the sport and because they could practice their religion at a sacred site. <coughs> Excuse me. Nice sacrificial scene here, roasting uh, meat over a burning altar. Gods, athletes, and spectators went well together at Olympia. The sacrifice of a hundred oxen to Zeus brought a lavish public meat feast, and Dionysus smiled as victors, friends, and fans celebrated with wine and song. But Olympia had even more than sport, religion, and conviviality. As Ovid and Tertullian 
wrote of crowds at Roman events, people went to see and to be seen. There were things to see, sport, temples and arts, art, yes. All Greco-Roman public sports and entertainments were spectacles, things for people to see. Olympia was also a great place to be seen, to make a name for oneself. So Alcibiades, dashing in this mosaic uh, from the Spartan Museum, won the chariot race in 416 after he'd entered seven chariots in the same event. And he gained attention at Olympia thereafter as a scandalous party animal. Themistocles made a prominent appearance at the stadium after the Battle of Thalamus, and Herodotus read aloud from his histories at Olympia because he knew there would be great crowds there from all over the Greek world. Yes, then and now, there was more going on at the Olympics than sport. But sport remained the center of attention, the best reason to attend. Why go to the modern Olympics when you can see and hear better, and certainly cheaply, more cheaply, via television? You go because there's something special and memorable about being there, being at least a small part of a great phenomenon. And the athletes, why did they compete? Please understand the Olympics were serious, not harmless play or good clean fun, not sport for the sake of sport. Participation alone was not enough. As in this scene here, wreaths were given only to individual first place victors, no teams, no medal events. One at, well, many athletes, like Camillus of Alexandria, prayed for victory or death, one or the other. He died boxing in the stadium. Winning wasn't everything. It was the only thing. There was little dignity in defeat, and the losers were deeply ashamed. Pindar writes of defeated boys sneaking home by their back streets. Epictetus says, in the Olympic Games, you cannot just be beaten and then depart. But first of all, you'll be disgraced, not only before the people of Athens or Sparta or Nicopolis, but before the whole world. So why risk it? Then and now, there's no simple answer. Athletes' motives then were complex. The pursuit of victory was a central notion in Greek culture. Similar notions of competitive manliness went back to Homer. Homer, of course, said there's no greater glory for a man than what he wins by his footwork and the skill of his hands. At Olympia, victors only got a wreath of olive leaves and bunches of foliage and fillets, sort of colored strips of wool here. Uh, the, the actual crown or wreath came from the judges, and these were sort of spontaneous honors uh, applied by admiring spectators. Yet all of these decorations were cherished for their symbolic value. Associated with divine favor, a simple crown could turn one into a hero venerated by others. But athletes were not immune to profit, and Greek sport included material rewards as well as symbolic honors. States began rewarding their Olympic victors with processions like this and material rewards. An Athenian Olympic victor got 500 drachmas from the state, worth perhaps $350,000 today. Also, ancient Olympians competed wherever they wanted and accepted valuable prizes and rewards without any stigma attached. At Athens, the men's sprint victor won 120 of these beautiful Panathenaic amphoras, full of olive oil, weighing about 80 pounds apiece, worth about $67,000, $80,000 nowadays for one sprint race. The ancient Greeks simply had no concept of professional versus amateur athletics. Amateurism as an ideal came into the modern games from the 19th century, and for good or ill, the games now have dropped the idea. There was no doubt that ancient victors became rich stars, and not everybody was happy about it. Oops, I hit the right button. That's better. It is another, another universe. My wife provided this. Yes, ancient critics from Xenophanes to Socrates condemned the adulation and rewards given to athletes, saying that rewards should go to thinkers and virtuous people, school teachers like my wife. But like today, nothing changed. Star power is money power. Did rich rewards and overemphasis on victory lead to corruption? Yes, at times. Note these stone bases here leading into uh, the entrance to the stadium. 
These bases held Xanes, statues of Zeus paid for by fines from athletes caught cheating, usually by bribery. But I do have to point out, to defend the ancient Greeks, there was no doping, okay? This is an idea that's cropping up in books, okay? We have to eliminate this idea of magic mushrooms and the ancient Olympics. Uh, it really irritates me. There's no ancient evidence for this. However, like today, some athletes transferred loyalties and competed for other states. Yes, some ancient Olympias, Olympians were flawed mortals, and the ancient ideal that promoted effort and virtue was not perfectly constantly actualized. Throughout history, individuals have always been flawed. Ideals have always been greater than individuals. That's why we have ideals. Yes, some ancient athletes made mistakes, some do today. But as this relief, the pose, the posture, the downcast eyes, as it suggests, most of them were inspired by the ideal of victory, symbolized by the wreath, an ideal that combined notions of effort, piety, and modesty. Pindar called athletic victory the greatest heights to which a mortal could aspire. Victory brought a form of immortality through, through fame, kleos, but it had to be tempered by humility and an appreciation of divine favor. Gods first, athletes second, spectators third. In conclusion, I've tried to show you the new or real ancient Olympics as revealed by ancient studies and archaeology, but not a distortion of ancient history in service to modern times. Nevertheless, I do not see the ancient games as irrelevant. The great truth about the ancient Olympics is not a matter of details and decorations of events and prizes, but rather something deeper. <clears throat> as Thucydides said, human nature is the key and the purpose. Times change, games change, but human beings, athletes and spectators, do not. The truth transcends history into the realm of art, images and ideas, works and words of beauty. The relevance of the ancient Olympics, then, is in the ideal, the inspiration, not in the incidentals. For some 1,200 years, the ancient games remained a celebration of human effort and achievement. However imperfect the Olympics were back then, or however imperfectly they are understood now, that something from antiquity still fascinates and still inspires us. That, my friends, proves the essential relevance and the enduring value of the ancient Olympics for today's world. Thank you. <laughs>